Yeah, hi. Uh, good evening, everyone. So I hope today we won't have any of the tech issues we had last time. Right. Uh, so as I was uh, mentioning to you last time, we are now at a stage in the journey of a hypothetical case where effectively the drafting of the relevant case or petition or suit has in fact been effected. And we are now at the stage of filing the case before the registry of the court or the tribunal concerned. Now, today we will not only be dealing with the filing process, but we will also be dealing with uh, the very preliminary uh, sort of issues which you might face in the uh, sense of the listing of the case. For instance, when the case gets listed before the court for the first time, what are the aspects that you need to bear in mind? Issues like reading the cause list, uh, understanding how a roster system functions within the courts, etc., etc. So both of these we will deal with together in today's class. Now, uh, see, as you've all may, uh, noticed, I'm sure if you've done your internships with uh, litigation firms or advocates, that uh, a large part of the administrative work in relation to uh, the running of a law office is ensuring that paper books are properly put together and are filed before a court of law. Now, always remember that unlike uh, uh, that, unlike in the case of uh, maybe a very few examples of grossly understaffed court systems in the country. I am told there are a few of these, uh, maybe trial courts in remote locations or uh, very, very small tribunals where there is uh, not much in the sense of a registry. Uh, in as much as the judge concerned may have a clerk or let's say a personal assistant who will personally essentially receive filings or pleadings on behalf of parties and do the needful. But uh, in the mainstream legal system, uh, at least in the big cities or the towns, uh, every court or every judicial setup consists of not only the judges who actually hear matters, but also something which we in common parlance called the registry of the court. Now, the registry is essentially like a filter or like an inbox in the sense that this is the entity to which you will go and submit your pleading. And this is the entity which will then check the pleading in terms of certain predefined rules and then either mark defects on the same, which is the process we will come to, or pass it for listing. Now, once this approval is given, a number is generated in the sense that uh, considering the, the uh, particular system being followed by the court or tribunal, a particular number will be allotted to the case depending on the subject matter or depending on the year, etc. And then the case is then formally placed before the judge concerned, the single bench or the division bench in a high court or say the ADJ or the district judge in a district court for further processing or further hearing on the merits of the matter. So this is the process in brief. Now, See, it's relatively straightforward to be able to put together a paper book. There is a lot of worry and anxiety. I personally also felt this when I had started joined the profession in terms of how to put together a paper book. But uh, effectively, if you are able to source a couple of good examples of the way in which that paper book is to be maintained in the sense of either the subject matter jurisdiction, say original side or appellate side, uh, in the form of previous formats or previous files, which have been actually filed and processed by the registry, life becomes much easier. Also, it's possibly a good idea to be up to date with the rules and regulations of the particular court or tribunal, because these keep changing. For instance, in the Delhi High Court, there is something called practice uh, directions or practice notifications, whereby the registry every now and then revises the format or revises the mechanism or the manner in which certain pleadings are to be filed. You also have to bear in mind the subject matter because the different areas in a, in a, in a, in a court, for instance, the appellate side, the original side, the writ side, all of whom may have different rules and regulations in terms of how the paper books are to be made. To give you one example, we will just see that now. I, will, I, have, uh, I had forwarded or uploaded on the NALSA forums a draft suit Interestingly, this is the one which was filed against Pro Professor Shamnath Bashir uh, in terms of uh, trying to take down his criticism or uh, his blog post in relation to a, uh, a certain litigation which was ongoing in the country then. 
but more than the subject matter of the particular litigation, what I'm more concerned with is taking you through the paper book in the sense of how a suit, which was actually drafted and got ready, eventually got filed in court. So if you will just go to that particular suit, I think I'll be able to explain what I want to say in clearer terms. Yes. So first let's go to the suit. So this is the suit, which I had shared on the NALSA forums. Now, see, this is typically how a paper book is made out. Uh, you will at the very top have the description of the court. Importantly, you will have a description of what roster, I mean, sorry, not roster, what subject matter the suit is being filed under. So therefore, if you are, uh, let's say if the pleading or the case is in the original side jurisdiction of the court, as is the case here, you will say it's in the original jurisdiction. Now, if this were a writ petition, I would have said extraordinary civil jurisdiction. So therefore, if it was a writ, criminal writ petition, I would have said extraordinary criminal jurisdiction. So therefore, ultimately, you need to specify what is the kind of subject matter jurisdiction which you are invoking. You also need to specify what is the, what is the variety or what is the type of case which you are filing. So here we are filing a suit. Now, please remember this terminology CSOS is specific to the Delhi High Court because CSOS essentially stands for Civil Suit Original Site. Now, if you go to other courts, let's say high courts outside Delhi, you will have high courts possibly where this terminology is suit number. There will be high courts where the terminology is simple civil suit number or original suit number. So this will vary depending on the, uh, the different high courts or the different courts or different tribunals before which the pleading might be filed. Then, of course, you would need to put in a very brief uh, uh, enumeration of the name of the parties and identify them in terms of their standing in terms of plaintiff, defendant, petitioner, respondent, etc. Now you need to come to the, uh, the index, which also will give you an idea of how these different applications or how the different parts of a pleading are to be put together. Now, the reason why I chose this particular index is this is a very comprehensive or let's say a more complex way of filing a pleading, because this is in terms of the revised Delhi high court original side rules. Now a typical case, let's say a writ petition will usually have a much simpler sort of an index or a much simpler way of putting together a brief. To give you a practical example in a writ petition, you will have the writ, but you will have essentially a list of dates. Of course, things like the memo of parties, things like urgent application, etc., are part of every single uh, filing. We will come to that in detail. But in a writ petition, you will have a much simpler way because you will only have one index. Here you have different parts. If you see this document, there is a part one, part two, part three. In a simplistic filing, let's say in a writ petition, you don't have any different parts. You have a chronological setting out of these different documents. You will have an index, obviously. You may have an urgent application for listing it urgently, a memo of parties, which is essential. You will have a page wherein you will set out the court fee. Then, and in a writ petition, that court fee is usually a negligible amount. Technically, there shouldn't be a court fee on a writ petition in the strict sense. And uh, then you will all, after that, you will have uh, things like the actual writ petition. Then you will have the annexures to the writ petition. And then you would obviously conclude with the supporting affidavit and the vakalatnama, if any, or if there are also interlocutory applications seeking stay, et cetera, then those will continue thereafter. But this is essentially the one of the more complex manners of creating a paper book, because this is what the Delhi High Court original side rules will require. Something very similar is also put in place by the Commercial Courts Act in terms of what are the differentiated requirements in terms of what you need to file along with a particular suit. But that will come to later. We will have a specific session purely on the Commercial Courts Act because that's a very important topic in today's day and age. Now, if you see this, you have this list of the index first, then you will possibly, and we will go through this one by one, but you will have these four different parts. Please bear that in mind. So the main part is the one which will contain the suit or the plaint as a whole. Part two will contain the applications, the interim applications. Now, interim applications we will deal with in a separate session in terms of what are the different kinds of interim applications and what is the purpose or purport behind filing them. Uh, part three is something which is concerned with only the Vakalatnama. While part four contains the list of documents which you are filing along with the suit. Now, always bear in mind this fact. We are very, very used nowadays in almost all jurisdictions, for instance, arbitration or writ petitions or criminal petitions to mark 
annexures. This format is not followed usually in original site suits because in original site suit suits in the plaint you never mark an annexure. You will only ever what you are required to ever and the documents which you seek to utilize in support of your case are separately filed in, in, in a particular order in a separate compilation altogether. So that is what is reflected here in part four. Now to take you through this, you will see also see then the lawyer at the end of the, at the foot of the page essentially gives his identification. And in a lot of courts, you are also be required to give your bar council enrollment number. This is obviously something which doesn't require a lot of elaboration. Then you have the index for part one itself, which again follows to a large extent, the same format. Now, if you see, uh, you will have something called a status page. This is something which is uh, not really you know, in the strict sense required. But this is something which this particular uh, filing entity, the firm has required, uh, which sought to do so. Now, this is what is something which is something very typical in the Indian, I mean, the Delhi system, at least, where you have to file an application for urgency so that your matter is listed in urgency. This is something which is filed for almost all matters nowadays as a routine, because non-filing of an urgent application means that your case may get listed after four months or five months. So this is something which you have to do as a routine, at least in Delhi. And I, I'm, I'm sure uh, there might be something similar in other courts as well. Now, memo of parties. This is crucial. Always remember a memo of parties is required to be filed in every litigation conceivable. Because this is where you set out for the court in very clear terms, the parties, their addresses, their status within the suit or within the petition in terms of their positioning, either as plaintiffs or petitioners or defendants or respondents. And this is essentially the memo which will be utilized by the court to pass an order or decree in your favor. So particularly in the case of original site suits, you will in fact find judgments where wrongly parties are mentioned in the memo of parties in terms of they may be spelling mistakes in the names or there may be some other errors. And then, you know, there is a lot of litigation after the decree is passed because somebody moves for a correction saying, oh, I'm sorry, in the memo of parties, I put the name wrong. So something so simple can actually lead to significant consequences in the future. So even though this sounds very pedestrian, please be very careful when you make your memo of parties in terms of identification, especially in civil suits, because here the rigor of the CPC applies in full force. Now, once we go beyond the memo of parties, effectively you have the suit, which then proceeds in terms of setting out the, the entirety of the matter on the merits. And once this is over, at the end, evidently, you will have the prayer, the prayer clause, because this also is essentially effectively what you will be getting from the court. And you will obviously have to pray for it. And uh, always remember, as a fall gap, always make this prayer F in all of your pleadings. Whatever may be the pleading you are doing, whether it's a suit or a criminal appeal or a writ petition, before any forum in the country, always have a residual prayer. So that if the court wants to mold relief in your favor at any stage, there should not be a technical argument that this was a relief which was never prayed for. And you can actually, there's a reported judgment on this in the case where, if you all remember, the former CVC, Mr. Thomas, whose uh, appointment was challenged. And uh, there was that uh, Supreme Court judgment of Justice Kapadias where his appointment was set aside. In fact, this was one of the grounds taken I believe uh, that uh, the prayer which was actually be sought to be prayed in the oral submissions or sought to be given by the court was never sought for in the uh, plaint in the in the PIL and the court answered this by referring to the residual prayer in that PIL saying this prayer essentially gives us a wide sort of power to be able to pass whatever relief we want to to give appropriate justice in the facts of that case so again this sounds very simple but so that you are never caught off guard when the court wants to give you a particular relief, though you have not sought it fit to claim it, but now you want to get the benefit of it, always put in place a residual clause. Now we come to the verification. Now verification is important because even under the CPC, the CPC provides for a verification. Now a verification is nothing but a reiteration of the fact that what has been stated in the pleading in the initial portion, uh, in terms of the specific paragraphs, is something which has been done with full consciousness 
and that the person who's swearing to the uh, plead to the pleading is somebody who is doing it with full knowledge of the contents of what is stated therein. So this is a typical example of a verification. Now, please bear in mind increasingly in a lot of cases when there is a supporting affidavit with the pleading, uh, this verification is sometimes not done. It is eschewed, but it is always better to have a verification at the foot of the prayer also so that you can avoid any technical objections in the future. But uh, beyond this, what is also very critical and what we had dealt with in some uh, detail on the last occasion when the uh, when my voice kept dropping, unfortunately, subsequently, is the format of the affidavit. Now, see, the reason why an affidavit is crucial is this is essentially the document which takes ownership of the pleading. Because till now you have, let's say, a large uh, amount of material which is being presented to the court. And at the end, you have a simplicity signature of the party who which wants to say so, supported or backed up by the lawyer's signature. But the affidavit, the notarized affidavit is the one that really gives this legal sanctity. Because it is the affidavit which embraces the pleading in a legal sense and binds the person who makes these statements to those pleadings. And at the same time, crosses that legal threshold for the court to now take this pleading on record as a case or as a full-fledged litigation in terms of the rules of the particular court. Now, in an affidavit, this is a standard format in the sense that uh, you are required to say that uh, the deponent, the deponent is the person who's swearing the affidavit. He's also the person who will sign the pleading, has uh, done this particular act under two or three situations. One, that he is the authorized signatory on account of his position in the plaintiff, if the plaintiff is a corporate, that he has read the plaint or the pleading and it has been drafted under his or her instructions and that this is a pleading which he wholeheartedly adopts and wishes to place before the court. Now, the affidavit will also have an independent verification at the second stage or the bottom portion, wherein the affidavit will then say that the contents of the affidavit in the foregoing portion are true to the knowledge, to the best of the knowledge of the plaintiff and nothing material has been concealed therefrom. Now, this affidavit, please remember, has to be then notarized either before an oath commissioner or a notary public, depending on the jurisdiction which you are in. And uh, the requirement of this notarization is that the person who is actually attesting is personally present before the notary public or the uh, oath commissioner. Now, this is where I want to point out something to you, which is of importance. See, increasingly it is a practice and it is widespread. It's not something, uh, let, let's say, very rare. And it's not necessarily a very pernicious practice either for the sake of convenience that advocates go to oath commissioners or notary publics. And because the advocate is present, the oath commissioner or the notary public simplicitor stamps the affidavit without really requiring the person who is deposing to be before him or her. This is something which is widespread, but technically it is wrong. Because under the requirements, the, and as you will see a stamp here, I identify the deponent who has signed in my presence. For a notary or an oath commissioner to, to ever or to notarize the affidavit, it is imperative that the party which is so signing must be physically present before the notary public or the oath commissioner. So this is widespread that people don't do this for the sake of convenience that somebody doesn't have to come all the way to the notary public or the oath commissioner. This is routinely done in the sense that the oath commissioner or notary public will sign on this without really requiring the presence of the party. The deponent in all, all cases will sign it at his office or its home, send it to the lawyer and the lawyer or his court staff will go and get this done. But if there is ever an objection that the other side raises, though it's a hyper technical objection, that this affidavit was wrongly notarized because the deponent never really turned up there, then it's a serious issue. So if you search online, you will find every now and then some judgment where the other side raises a hue and cry. And this usually arises in the case of parties which are situated in a different uh, territorial jurisdiction. For instance, uh, the authorized signatory is based out of Bombay. Now, therefore, if a notary is actually signing it in Delhi, then there is some suspicion on the other side that look, this person, person possibly did not come down to Delhi to get this done. 
and therefore in such situations it is much safer that the person gets it notarized in bombay wherever he or she is and sends it across to you so always remember that when you enter litigation or uh, uh, if you go for an internship you will you will see very often that this is done very casually in offices but please remember it can have significant consequences because if your signature is put on the affidavit in the sense of the advocate because he also has to attest to the oath commissioner that he identifies the particular person then in future you may land up in serious trouble so therefore please bear this tip in mind even though it may sound inconvenient to the extent possible always insist that your client or the person who is attesting to the affidavit turns up before the oath commissioner so that his signature is then duly put in the register which the oath commissioner will maintain and that there will be no controversy in this regard in the future now this is a standard form of the affidavit but i also want to show you two different versions to just make out this one small difference which can arise in different situations so there is a small difference in the capacities in which you may attest to an affidavit now let's say you are filing an affidavit in support of a case or a pleading which is purely in a personal capacity for instance you are filing a writ petition this is let's say a draft format of a affidavit you are filing in a writ petition now yeah now in this particular affidavit if you see this is a very personal list when i say personal list what i mean is john doe himself is aggrieved by let's say some action taken by the delhi development authority in terms of let's say denying him all allocation or allotment of a particular apartment which he wants he will go to court and he will file a writ petition let's presume against the tda now please see para 3 of the affidavit here john doe is going to say the factual averments in the application are true to my knowledge while the legal submissions made therein are based on legal advice no difficulty now this is important true to my knowledge why is he saying true to my knowledge because everything that has occurred in this particular controversy in terms of him applying for an apartment him being rejected him protesting to the dda dda refusing to do anything about it are all matters which he is personally aware of now the difference arises in a case let's say where john do now attests to an affidavit or signs an affidavit on the basis of his company now let's say six subsequently there is a company called supreme structures which john do is working with supreme structures wants to file an arbitration petition against the rail vikas nigam limited and tells john jo don jo please sign this affidavit for us and be our authorized representative in the court of law john do says okay but now see para 3 because in when you are repairing for a company a lot of what you are saying will be based upon the records of the company for instance john do is somebody possibly who is sitting in a headquarter let's say in the head office of the company the company is doing some work say in meghalaya now in meghalaya they get into a dispute with rail vikas nigam limited and now they want to file this application so a lot of what is written in the petition or the application will not be to john do's personal knowledge because he's not he's not there in meghalaya he is sitting in the head office here some things he may have personal knowledge of for instance the letter which may have been written to rvnl asking for damages or compensation that john do may have seen being drafted in the head office but a lot of the other issues he is going to glean knowledge of them only by looking into the records of the company say emails say balance sheets etc so when you are attesting to something which is not purely in your personal capacity you need to then word the affidavit to say are true to my knowledge and also derived from the records of the petitioner this is the correct way of doing it because then at least you are very clear that your knowledge is not something which is purely based on personal knowledge but emanates from documents so this is just to show you that slight difference in terms of the status or the capacity in which you might be attesting to something now uh, as i mentioned uh, in the case of the paper book another aspect which you need to bear in mind is that in the case of a company for instance here natco pharma ultimately who is the person who is filing the pleading it is this gentleman mr jagbir sharma 
So in the case of a company or a partnership firm or a larger entity, whoever is the person who is filing the particular pleading will need to have a letter of authorization or a board resolution or a power of attorney authorizing him or her to so represent the company and actually initiate litigation on its behalf or defend litigation on its behalf before a court of law. So always remember if your client or if the party which is coming to you is not an individual, you will require the requisite authorization of the person who is coming to you to actually file the case on behalf of a larger entity. Another important thing, Vakalatnama. See, Vakalatnama or the authorization for a lawyer to appear, it's pretty straightforward. You will find multiple formats. Basically, it's only going to be a paragraph saying, in so-and-so case, I so-and-so do hereby authorize so-and-so to appear and plead for me in the matter. Now, traditional Vakalat Sama, you will find multiple formats. So I don't want to put this up on the screen right now, wherein you will have other nuances saying things like, you know, that you fully authorize for all purposes in terms of withdrawing money also, in terms of <coughs> signing documents, filing documents before the court, etc., etc. There are some more innovative Vakalat Namas, which I've seen where the lawyer also says that by any chance, if I don't turn up on that date, I don't appear in court and your case gets dismissed, you will not have any claim for damages against me. <laughs> you know, uh, somewhat more innovative um, Kalatnama is also out there. But again, that is not something which is essential to the pursuit of the case in terms of the authorization of the lawyer concerned. So you must have the uh, Vakalatnama also. Also remember, as we mentioned, when we talked about uh, prerequisites in the class where we spoke about prerequisites, uh, whatever is the court fee which you require to pay, that is also something which you will have to annex along with the particular suit or plaint or pleading. So this is essentially how you need to deal with creating a paper book. Now, always remember, again, to go down to the specifics, when you've created a paper book, please make multiple copies thereof. Because depending on the rules of the particular forum or court that you are in, not only after you file the original with the court, original is going to be with the court, not only will you require a copy, not only will your client require a copy, but on various occasions to make service on the opposite side, particularly if it is advanced service, as some jurisdictions or some courts will insist, you will need multiple copies. And especially if you're going to serve government departments, a lot of the departments will have uh, inane rules or inane requirements asking you to give three copies, four copies or five copies of a pleading because they have their internal mechanisms in terms of possibly having to send one to the department, one to the lawyer, one to the legal cell, one to a possibly any other entity. So always bear in mind, make multiple copies. Uh, also uh, bear in mind the fact that uh, when you are making a pleading, uh, it is important to also ensure that it is not very cumbersome in terms of the uh, in terms of how it is structured, particularly in the case of voluminous pleading. So in, see, in various courts, you will have some sort of an inbuilt in, uh, limit. For instance, the Delhi High Court requires that any pleading or any documentation put together which exceeds 200 pages uh, is then immediately to be converted or extended by a further volume. So for instance, if I have a petition, say, which is 280 pages, that will necessarily have to be filed in two volumes with pages 1 to 200 in one volume in the sense of the physical paper book, while uh, pages 201 to 280 forming a separate paper book. This is to ensure that things don't get too bulky. So even if the court or forum where you are going is, does not have this particular thing in place, always bear in mind, uh, do not make pleadings which are too bulky because it makes it difficult then to pleadings or uh, volumes, individual volumes which are too bulky, because not only does it become a problem then to be able to uh, deal with them, uh, but also it creates a difficulty when the judge tries to browse through the particular uh, petition or the pleading. Now, uh, also uh, bear in mind one fact that uh, when, when you file this pleading, this is not the end of the story. When you file a pleading with the registry, invariably you will be given a stamp and please ensure that this obviously happens. It's not something you have to worry about. It happens as a matter of course that when you file a pleading, you will inevitably be given a stamp on any portion of the pleading, which will attest to the date and in some circumstances, the time on which the pleading is filed. This is very, very crucial because this is essentially what determines whether you filed something within limitation or not. 
So in cases where you're filing in the nick of time, and on, let's say, the last day of limitation or something, this becomes very, very important. Once you filed a paper book in court, there is a further process of scrutiny by the registry. And if the registry finds defects in your pleading, now what are defects? For instance, you filed a pleading like this, you forgot to attach court fees. Or your vakalatama is not in the proper format. Or let's say in certain uh, jurisdictions, certain courts, there is a requirement to affix a lawyer's welfare fee with the vakalatam. This is there in Delhi, a 10 rupee uh, stamp or a 20 rupee stamp for lawyer's welfare. Now, if any of these prerequisites are not met, your affidavit is not in order, the pleading is not in the correct format, etc., etc., the registry will mark defects. Essentially, this is the checklist of things you need to change in your plaint or in your uh, pleading. Now, please bear in mind, in under a lot of rules, under a lot of jurisdictions, there is a time limit within which you must do it. Usually, it's one month. The Supreme Court, it's one month. Delhi High Court, it's one month. If you don't remedy those defects within that one month period, and let's say you file after two months or three months, you will invariably have to seek condemnation of delay in getting the matter listed. In the case of certain subject matters like Section 34 petitions, etc., under the Arbitration Act, where the time limits are very, very strict, this can be a very difficult proposition. So always bear in mind, after you file the petition, you are required to remove defects. And this is something which might be taken off care of, say, by your office staff. But you need to bear in mind the fact that there is an outer limit within which you must file it. So because a lot of people get comfortable, they file something within limitation and then they don't bother checking up on it for four months or five months. That is a very, very dangerous practice. Therefore, always ensure do not do that. Keep following up with the matter till the registry clears it. So after, let's say, you've gotten the uh, petition with you, after the registries mark defects on it, and you have gone ahead and cleared all those defects to the satisfaction of the registry, the registry will at that stage formally clear the matter. Now, when it clears the matter, it then officially gives you a case number. Now, if you see at the top of this paper book, there is a reason why that uh, case number is written in hand. Because when the lawyer filed this case in court, they, they didn't have a case number. It is only after the registry cleared it for listing that the lawyer was intimated of what the case number was. And the lawyer then accordingly put that case number along with the cost item in his own hand. This is for future reference. So that's the stage at which the case number comes about. Now, one last thing before we move to the next stage, something I skipped. In many jurisdictions, uh, you will also have to give an undertaking to the fact when you're filing as to whether uh, there is a caveat which has been received by the court or not. So see, let's say you are the plaintiff. Now, if you are the plaintiff, what you will possibly do is that when you file the particular plaint in court, you may not have received any intimation from the other side as to them having filed a caveat in court. Now, what is a caveat? A caveat is nothing but an intimation to a court that you are anticipating certain litigation to arise against you. And that in anticipation of this litigation, you are intimating the court that if any case comes to be filed against you, you should be given advance notice before the court passes any order against you. Now, in many cases, you know, there is a possibility that there is no requirement for advance service and urgent matters, interlocutory applications can get listed before a court. And it is very, very possible that a court passes an ex parte order against the respondent, keeping in account the urgency of the matter. So therefore, in many jurisdictions, you will be required to go to a particular part of the registry and inquire from the registry if any caveat has been lodged against your client in a matter or not. And if there is no such lodging, then you are required to give that report. So if you see here, you are required to go to that particular part of the registry and get a stamp from there saying there is no caveat. Because if there is a caveat, then invariably you will be required to make advanced service to the other side. 
Now, please bear in mind, even in the absence of a caveat having been launched, there might be specific court rules requiring you to make advanced service in certain cases. That depends from court to court and system to system. Now, also bear in mind, therefore, if you are a defendant or if you are somebody who is anticipating litigation against you, it is advisable to file a caveat with the uh, particular court where you apprehend that the other side might be planning to launch a litigation or file an appeal or whatever might be the situation. So these are essentially the elements which you need to take into account when you go to the aspect of filing. So now we have done with filing, we are done with uh, the uh, defects clearance and we are done with the uh, final marking of the matter in the sense that there is a specific number allotted to it. Now what happens? Uh, this is also a, a reasonably interesting element of what really happens or transpires at this stage. Now you have something called the roster. Now in the roster, I hope the, so this is something which I had not shared with you uh, formally. Uh, I hope this is uh, visible to everybody. If somebody can just uh, message me and let me know if the roster is visible. For some reason it's, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Omak. So this is essentially a roster. Now, what is a roster? A roster is nothing but a subject matter division of judicial work between different benches of a particular court. Now, rosters are segregations which are very specifically enumerated in larger courts, say a high court or a Supreme Court. And there is also a roster which is in play in the, uh, let's say, trial courts too, in, in most situations. But let's say, you know, there may be a tribunal which only deals with one particular subject matter, say NCLAT or NCLT. In that case, there may not be any subject matter division strictly, though even, even now today in the NCLT and NCLAT, there are certain subject matter divisions in terms of, say, company matters, insolvency matters, etc. But it's not as fleshed out as it is in the case of larger judicial institutions, say, like a high court. Now, if you see this roster, this roster is what determines which bench it is your case will go before. And this roster keeps changing. Uh, usually it changes once in six months or once in one year and different judges are then marked different subject matters. Now to just take an example, if what I had filed before the registry was a public interest litigation, inevitably this public interest litigation will end up before court number one presided over by the chief justice. And that is because the roster says all PIL matters before court number one. Now, therefore, the roster is what determines and what should inform your knowledge or your decision in terms of what is the bench which will ultimately end up here in your matter. And this is a roster which is scrupulously followed. The only exception which sometimes occurs is if there is a particular bench which is marked a roster and for any personal reason the judge concerned does not want to take up the case then those matters are then referred to the chief justice. See, because ultimately the chief justice has ultimate discretion. And in th those cases, therefore, the chief justice uh, might decide to actually try and list it before a particular other bench, even though the roster may strictly not be applicable. Also do bear in mind that even though rosters are followed in certain courts and jurisdictions, if matters are part heard, for instance, there's a particular judge, let's say Honorable Justice Rajiv Shakhtar, who is hearing a matter now, he's judge in charge of the original site and he is hearing a matter under, let's say, the Arbitration Act. Or let's say he's hearing, in this case, he's not given matters under the Arbitration Act. The roster says he will hear original side matters. Now, let's say he hears an original side matter, say, over two months. He's part heard the matter, but the hearings are not concluded. And tomorrow the roster changes and let's say he goes to the criminal side or he goes to any other roster. Under the Delhi High Court, a judge is then allowed to retain that a part heard matter. In certain high courts, that's not allowed. I am informed in the Calcutta High Court, irrespective of how long the matter may have gone on, once the roster changes, the matter immediately gets disassociated from that judge concerned. So there are certain exceptions based on different court systems. Now, this is essentially a roster. Now, once the roster is in place, you will now have the matter being placed before that particular court or tribunal by the registry concerned. 
Now what happens? Your case now gets listed for the very first time before the court. What do you do? So every listing before the court is captured in something called the cause list. Every court essentially publishes a list of its daily business, which is referred to as a cause list. Now in the cause list, you will find a wealth of information in terms of the daily. So I've taken this cause list from January, the Delhi High Court, because after the pandemic and the restricted functioning, cause lists today are, a slight, are slightly different in terms of their content. So this is a wealth of information. For instance, the cause list will tell you important details like where mentioning of matters is to be done. Mentioning is something which again varies from court to court. A uh, mentioning is something whereby uh, the registry may not list your matter, say in a day or two, but the relief you're seeking is that urgent. Somebody is out to arrest you. Your bank guarantees are getting encashed, etc. So there is a procedure in various courts to mention matters out of turn directly before the concerned authority. In the case of the Delhi High Court, the authority is the Chief Justice. So if you want an urgent listing of a matter, you need to mention the matter the very first thing in the day when the uh, Chief Justice presides over the bench, when he comes in to preside over the bench. Now, it also will give you other information like if any court is on leave, it's not assembling today. Uh, it will probably tell you uh, that there will be a change in the sitting of a particular judge in terms of the courtroom. It may tell you about special benches which are coming up on that particular day. It may contain deletions because matters which may have been shown in, say, an advanced cause list, in the final cause list of the day, they may get deleted for various reasons. They may be shifted to other courts. They may be deleted because there is some other defect, etc., etc. And of course, there are notes and circulars in terms of you know, some important contemporary development, let's say, uh, Lok Adalat, etc., etc. It will also contain a list of uh, judgments which are being pronounced on that particular day so that parties are given advance intimation, lawyers are given advance intimation that a judgment is getting pronounced. Now, aside from all of this, a cause list is important because it tells you what item is your matter listed as and before which judge. For instance, to take this example, let's say you filed a completely new case. You filed a civil miscellaneous petition and it's coming up before the court for the first time on the 31st of January 2020. Now, when you see the cause list in the evening, you either search by the name of the party or by the lawyer's name, and you will come to know that this judge, this particular uh, matter is listed, let's say, before court number 24. Now, in court number 24, and this is again something which will change from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but in the context of the Delhi High Court, please see something called a supplementary list. Now, how this works in the Delhi High Court is that you have different lists. There is something called an advanced list. An advanced list functions for pending matters. For instance, you have a matter in January. Now, on that date, the judge concerned gives you a next date, let's say in March, let's say 20th of March. So the registry knows in January itself that on the 20th of March, it has to list a matter of yours before the court. Therefore, almost let's say four or five days or a week in advance of the 20th of March, the registry will bring out a list called advanced list in which it will list all the matters which have already been deemed to have been or directed to have been listed for the 20th. This can obviously be done in advance because the registry is aware of the matter because it's pending. That's the advanced list. You also have a list which again differs from court to court called the regular list or the final hearing list. These are matters which have been admitted for final hearing. These are of old vintage, which have been admitted for final hearing and are pending before the court. Now, to give you an example here, for instance, before court number one, this is, say, the list of the regular matters or final hearing matters, which say, let's say, range in seniority, say, from 2011. Sometimes you'll find much older cases, 2006, 7, etc. These are the old cases which are pending disposal before the court and which have been admitted for hearing. So the advanced list and the regular list will come in advance because these are matters which are known to the registry will get listed. But now if you were to go back to that supplementary list, I'll just take some other quote. Now, if we were to go back to the supplementary list, let's say we go to quote number 
just this. Yeah. Now let's take quote number one. Now see the sub. So therefore, the advanced list invariably will come in chronology. So let's say there are 80 matters before court number one listed for 31st of January 2020 in the advanced list. So evidently the supplementary list will become will begin from the next number that is 81. Now this creates a lot of confusion. I remember when, my, when I was interning and for the first time when I accompanied uh, the senior, the lawyer to court, we had a supplementary matter and that was I think item sometime in the 20s. So I thought, oh, it will start with item number one and possibly, you know, we'll probably end up with a matter around lunchtime. So suddenly when I look at the display board, display board is essentially something in court, which tells you what item is going on before what court. And that's the best tool possible for a lawyer who has multiple matters. I ran around like a headless chicken when I suddenly saw that our matter came up first. I was in complete panic. I had no idea what happened. So that's the day I realized well, later when the matter got over and when I realized that, uh, you know, the supplementary list is something which is taken up together. So in many courts, you'll be surprised to find that in the, in the, in the morning at 1030, when the judge sits, suddenly item number 65 is called out or 66 is called out. And, uh, you know, item number one is nowhere to be seen. So this is the reason because supplementary lists many a times will start off where the advanced list ends. But because the supplementary list reflects the new matters, the matters which have gotten listed before the court for the very first time, they will invariably be taken up first by the court before it moves on to the advanced list. And if the advanced list is also over, then the court will move on to the regular list. Now, therefore, always bear in mind that the cause list is really the, uh, the, the best tool in the sense of determining where your matters reached and also determining how you can juggle your, your, your list of matters for the day. For instance, in a day I have, let's say three matters. So I have the first brief, which is sent to me, uh, the solicitor calls me in the evening and says, sirs, yours is effective supplementary three. Let's say I am doing this matter item number 83. So the solicitor will tell me, sir, your item number is 83. Supplementary list begins at 81. So effectively we are item number three. So at the back of my mind, I realized that yes, so I have a chance if I if the judge sits at 10.30, my matter may arrive say around 10.45 or 10.50, a very, very rough back of the envelope calculation. Now I am also briefed, let's say on that day in a different matter, which say in a different court is in the advanced list item number 10. And that court has a large supplementary list. So then I am rest assured that by the time this matter is taken up, the other matter will not reach. So I'm very comfortable. So the cause list also in this regard gives you a good idea in terms of how to manage your schedule for the day. What are the matters in which you may require the solicitor concern to ask for a Passover? A Passover is nothing but requesting the judge concern to take up your matter on the next call, as in requesting him or her through go through to skip your matter go through the rest of the list and come back to your matter again. So in a case where two matters are clashing, uh, it's very common for councils to ask for a Passover and Passovers are usually granted at the asking at least one Passover, but at a second Passover, you may be in trouble. So this is how a cause list functions in terms of uh, letting you know where your matter is listed, where it stands, etc, etc. Now, uh, increasingly with uh, the internet having come about and uh, websites also of courts, you know, being developed in terms of being far more efficient, you will also find a lot of the information in terms of, you know, the status, the latest orders, the filing, etc. Uh, from these websites. So I don't need to take you through that, but uh, the websites also of the courts, though the quality varies significantly between different high courts, etc. Also the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, the website can be a, obviously a very powerful tool in terms of uh, keeping in track of the orders that are passed, when your matter is getting listed, what is the next date of hearing, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So ultimately, as I mentioned, it's not just the drafting which is important in terms of actually getting your matter to court. Whatever we discussed today are primarily administrative aspects, not so legal. But for any litigating lawyer, these are very, very important to bear in mind because this is really something which scares off a lot of people because of uh, the kind of, uh, let's say, non-legal skills 
or uh, the kind of infrastructure which one may require to be able to effect the steps which we've just spoken about. But as you've seen from what I have shown you just now, this is again not something which is really very complex or not something which requires a massive skill set to do. Now, evidently, let's say you're filing a suit where there are pages, and this happens quite often, where there are, say, uh, documents in the realm of, say, 2,000 pages, 3,000 pages. So making a paper book is an uphill task. It's not easy. What I showed you now basically was maybe around 150 pages. That's not so difficult. But imagine a 2,000 page suit, 2,000 documents, numbering each of these documents, making sure there is no error, photocopying them, putting them into different volumes, numbering the volumes, making indexes. So it can be a very difficult task. But again, like I said, it might be difficult in terms of the amount of effort that you have to put in, but it's not really rocket science. So a lot of people, a lot of interns who come to me or generally people who are shy of getting into litigation, what we spoke about today is like one of the largest pieces of the puzzle as to why they are uh, not willing to do so. And uh, of course, there are a lot of problems on the legal side as well, but at least administratively, what we spoke about just now, these are not things which should really make anyone fear or make anyone detest the process of getting into litigation at any level. So this is essentially it from me in terms of the process, but uh, this is something which you will again uh, keep running into very, very often whenever you do an internship or obviously later on in time when you essentially decide to enter into the world of litigation. And uh, as I mentioned, this is something which can be tackled uh, relatively easily. But again, this remains a very important aspect of how exactly litigation functions in uh, <clears throat> the contemporary times. So uh, that's pretty much it from me in terms of uh, what this represents. Uh, if there are any queries, then yeah, please shoot in terms of what all this entails. And uh, again, just to, uh, while you're typing out your questions, this is something which can be, I mean, if this is something which you absolutely detest, then if you are purely into a council practice, then this is something which you can completely avoid. But uh, at least in the initial years, my uh, suggestion to you would be, do try and get a hands-on experience of this because it, it then gives you a much better understanding of how a paper book essentially works. And that will stand you in good stead in the years to come. So uh, after a point of time, you, you can delegate this, you can choose not to do it at all. But at least in the initial years, it's important to understand what all a paper book requires so that you are never caught on the wrong foot in the future if such an issue ever arises. So that is uh, pretty much it from me in this regard. If there are any specific queries in relation to what we've spoken of today, then yeah, please feel free to ask me about the same. Yeah, so very good question from Prashasti. I should have actually dealt with this. Yeah, when do matters shift from advanced list to regular list, right? So uh, see, initially what used to happen earlier on when the, let's say, post-independence or in the decade post-independence, you did not have this explosion in the kind of litigation which the courts were faced with. So if you read uh, biographies, autobiographies of lawyers who practiced in the 50s or 60s, you will find that there are examples given of judges who were hearing matters then who had six cases a day, seven cases a day, eight cases a day. That was the norm, at least in the high courts. So if that was a scenario, it was not very difficult for a judge to be able to dispose of those cases in that particular day. But ultimately, once the docket explosion came, the number of cases increased, a problem arose because the judges were too few and the cases were too, too, too uh, numerous in number. And this resulted in a problem that the cases listed before a judge on a particular day could not all be disposed of on that date if they were fixed for hearing otherwise. For instance, let's say in today's time, there are 50 matters listed before a particular judge. At least in 30 of them, the pleadings might be completed and the matter might be ripe for argument. Now it is humanly impossible for a judge to be able to hear all 30 of those matters and dispose of them in a day. So in the initial years, when this docket explosion happened, judges increasingly started resorting to a practice called admitting matters for hearing. Now, admission of a matter in the strict sense, though nowadays it can also have different connotation, means that the judge has now determined that the pleadings are complete and the matter is ripe for final hearing. And the admission of the matter would mean 
that the matter would be put in a separate list, which is now effectively referred to as the final list or the regular hearing list. And this would then be determined in terms of the seniority. For instance, if you are in the year 2020 and a judge admits your matter for hearing and places it in the final list, your seniority will be determined by how many cases precede your matter. So if there are cases before the judge, say from the year 2015 or 16, then your case is only going to be taken up once the earlier matters get taken up. So this process of admitting a case is what results in its shift from the advanced list to the regular list. But practically speaking, nowadays, like for a lot of lawyers and even for judges, this process is not is avoided, and the judge essentially tries to list that matter again in the advanced list on some other date, where he or she will try and dispose it of. This has happened because nowadays, if a matter is admitted for hearing, depending on the court you practice in, you are looking at a wait time between three to ten to twelve years before your matter comes up for hearing. So now for a lot of matters, getting a matter admitted and put in the regular list is effectively a death sentence, which is why increasingly lawyers now try and resist their matter getting admitted and judges also considering their difficult situation also to a large extent do try and list matters in advanced list on another day and try and dispose them off. But this has created a problem that matters which have already gone into the advanced list continue to languish. So their fate becomes far worse in the sense that, uh, you know, matters which are far, far younger, if I may call it that, or far more contemporary, start getting disposed of while the regular list remains the way it is. So that's a significant problem. But unfortunately, till we augment the number of judges we have, that I don't think is a problem which can be remedied in any satisfactory manner. So yeah, so for, for a very long answer to your question, Prashati, that's how matters shift from the advanced list to the regular list. When the judge formally says, I'm admitting this. Right. Uh, any other queries from anybody else? Perfect. Then I think we can uh, call it a, a day for today. And uh, then on the next date, uh, we will essentially talk about uh, elements such as uh, completion of pleadings. Once the matter comes, service of notice to the other side. And we'll also deal briefly with interlocutory applications in terms of what are the different kinds of interlocutory applications and uh, uh, what is the stage at which you file them and when are they decided, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So we'll deal with that. And then in the future classes, then we will move on to admission denial of documents, framing of issues, oral evidence, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Right. So I'll upload the uh, reading materials as usual by tomorrow. And then I'll see you guys day after. Right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.